rolling. This is the Fed Sock Films Podcast. Where we continue the conversation sparked, sparked on, on film. film. You want to know what freedom tastes like? It tastes like this beer. Take one. This is, in fact, the classic solution in search of a problem. Action it cannot help but be controversial. Cut. With expert discussion and analysis. With the greatest legal minds on the topic today. The Fed Sock Films Podcast. It's a wrap. Hey, do you remember when Congress hauled all those tech executives up to testify? No, not that time, the other time. They sure raked those suits over the coals for failing to toe the line. It's almost like they were trying to use their bully pulpit to pressure them. Hmm, is that something legislators should be doing? Anyhow, welcome to the FedSoc Films Podcast. I'm Ann Hartley, your hollering host. We recently made a film called Jawboned about misinformation and free speech. I have here with me Eric Jaffe, a partner at Share Jaffe, who holds some very unique views regarding government speech. Welcome, Eric. Thank you very much, and thanks for having me, Anne. Absolutely. Excited to talk to you here. So in our film, we talk about jawboning, that is the informal coercion of social media companies. It's a little bit of a tricky thing to pin down the difference between coercion and persuasion. But the big question is, should the government be engaging in this sort of activity? Well, from my admittedly somewhat unique perspective, the answer is generally no. But I have a very specific view of what it means to have the government engaged in jawboning, as opposed to, for example, individual politicians engaging in jawboning. So, for example, if a candidate for Congress or a sitting congressman running for re election were to get up and say, you should reelect me because I think social media companies need more regulation and I'm just the senator to do it or congressman to do it, that I suppose is jawboning. But I think that is perfectly legitimate speech by a candidate. Conversely, if the Department of Health and Human Services were to spend $100 million running an ad that said, don't listen to those crazy people, they're all wrong about where the virus came from in COVID, or don't use your masks, or, do, or use your masks, or any of the above, and started to participate in public debate using public money, I think that is improper government speech. So, so it's, it's important to distinguish who the speaker is, and even where the speaker is a government official, in what capacity they are speaking. Gotcha. So if I understand you correctly, you're saying that a, a congressman, this wouldn't necessarily be what you'd understand as uh, government speech. But if you're talking about a, um, a regulator at the EPA, that would fall under this definition. Well, uh, in both instances, the answer is maybe. So a regulator at the EPA who is invited to give a college uh, commencement speech and who says, look, in my experience as a government regulator, this is what I think is a good idea. This is what I think is a bad idea. And I would just encourage you all to go into public service and to do these things and that things and to be careful about social media and whatever. Uh, that's private speech, even though that person is an EPA regulator. But if that person spends public dollars giving that same message, then that's government speech. Conversely, for the congressperson, if the congressperson gets in front of a news camera and says, hi, I'm congressperson X, and I think this is the way the country should go, and this is what we should do, and that's my opinion, and that's, by the way, why you should vote for me <laughs> next election. Again, I think that's private speech. If that congressman were to take government money to fly all around the country to promote their bill that says we should ban social media or restrict social media, I think that's government speech because the public is paying for it. So again, the answer is it depends on context and who's paying for what. Gotcha. So it's, it's um, government-sponsored speech, so to say. Yes. Yeah. So the best way to think of this, or at least one, not the best way, but one of the ways to think of this is under the First Amendment, there's a so-called compelled speech doctrine where the government can't compel you to speak and it can't compel you to support the speech of other people with whom you disagree. So if the government said, hi, we're going to tax you and take your tax dollars and give it all to the RNC or to the DNC, depending on who's in charge at the time, uh, that would be compelled support for speech that I think would be inappropriate, even though it was being done through your tax dollars and through the government deciding to do it. 
And this is like that. They take my tax dollars, they give it to a congressman to fly all over the place, spreading an advocacy message that I may disagree with and how they can make me spend my proportional share of tax dollars to support what is basically government propaganda is the problem in my mind. Whereas if the congressman spends their own campaign dollars going around and saying, hi, this is what I would do as congressman, I think that's perfectly appropriate. Gotcha. So um, in terms of government speech, um, where do you think the line is exactly uh, for job owning? So the line, I think, is where you use your position and authority as a governmental entity, as opposed to your individual personal and private opinion. So even government employees and elected officials obviously have their own private speech rights. They get to talk, they get to opine on things, they get to campaign, which is a First Amendment right, obviously, for all elected officials. It is only when the speech starts to invoke the power and authority of the government, whether by taking your money to support it, so that's the power of the government to tax and then divert those taxes to basically viewpoint-directed speech, or uh, in some way threaten to use the power of office uh, to coerce people. So uh, we see very often, uh, and in particular, we saw some examples in this uh, Murphy case that was uh, up at the Supreme Court, uh, the suggestion that when the FBI calls you up and says, take that down, there's an implied or else, (laughs) or else we will do bad things to you via our government authority. It is not merely the private opinion of an individual FBI employee or even of the FBI director. It is an implied threat to use government authority. And I think that even in a, in a indirect form is problematic. That would be government speech and, in my opinion, inappropriate government speech. Uh, by contrast, when a congressman stands up and says, this is what I think would be good legislation, the congressman is not in a position to do that all by themselves. They are an individual member of Congress saying that they would introduce a bill, talking about what they would do uh, themselves. They don't have the authority to actually pass that bill by themselves without getting concurrence. And more importantly, they at least have the additional immunity of the speech and debate clause. So if they stood up on the floor of Congress and said, I think we should pass this bill because X, Y, Z, I would consider that to be permissible perfectly reasonable speech, even if in some sense it were speech in an official capacity by a person in government using their authority, for example, as a congressperson. Uh, so it just all, again, depends on context. But if they take our money and go on a, on a persuasion tour around the country, that's a different matter. So it, it, it sounds like at least a little bit, um, it's a question of, oh, I don't want to say viewpoint neutrality, but kind of approaching that. It would only be viewpoint neutrality where they are taking public resources to convey the viewpoint. So imagine uh, the simpler unconstitutional condition type of case, which says, I will give you a contract to haul trash in my city or my state or in the capital uh, only if you endorse me for for governor or, or for president or for, you know, congressperson. Uh, We would consider that to be inappropriate viewpoint discrimination, even though obviously you have no right to a contract to haul cash, you do have a right to compete for that contract free of viewpoint discrimination. And in some sense, taking my tax dollars to advocate for a particular viewpoint, a political viewpoint, a policy viewpoint, um, is similar. It says, I won't pay money to X or Y or Z a group unless they agree with me and advocate the positions I want them to advocate, whether you're hiring a PR firm or whatever it is, you're spending money and you're conditioning that spending of money on viewpoint communication, viewpoint-based communications. Uh, I would note here that it's important to understand that, look, the government implements viewpoints all the time. Obviously, the government has an opinion on should there be a border wall, shouldn't there be a border wall, should we pay for Medicaid, should we not pay? And they take action that is a consequence of a specific viewpoint on a specific issue. But the thing that people should understand 
is that while the government has all kinds of power to regulate, to do things, its power to speak is different. And if there's no other lesson people take from this, it is the lesson that speech is different. I say that simply as a logical consequence of the existence of the First Amendment. If we think the First Amendment constrains power over speech differently than, it con than the Constitution constrains power over conduct, then this is the natural and inevitable consequence of that, is that just as the government can force you to support an army or to support building a bridge, it can't force you to support advocacy of particular viewpoints. Gotcha. Let, let, let's get into that some more. I'm actually curious how this, how you've described with this concept of government speech and um, whether that, you know, lines up with the First Amendment or if it has maybe some conflict with um, the free speech clause. Sure. So let's start with the free speech clause doesn't protect governments. Um, I think that's largely accepted. Uh, the United States, in fact, made that point in their brief in the Murphy case, that state governments, for example, don't have First Amendment rights. And I think the correct secondary portion of that sentence would be, and neither does the federal government. States may have the power to speak, but they don't have a right to speak. People have rights. States and, and federal governments have delegated powers. So that's one, one thing where in terms of the First Amendment, uh, that there's no conflict with the notion of saying the government can or can't speak as being a First Amendment problem vis-a-vis -vis the government. Then you, the question is, does the government have a right to take my money to convey a particular viewpoint? And the simplest example is the one I gave earlier of what if they took my money and said, we think we need an ad campaign that says, elect only Republicans or elect only Democrats. If anyone thinks the government has the power to take $100 million or $500 million and run that ad campaign, I would say they have a mistaken notion of what the First Amendment means. That, to me, is the quintessential example of compelled support for viewpoint-based political speech that if it doesn't violate the First Amendment, I can't fathom what else it would violate. So uh, it falls to me under the notion of the freedom of speech, which includes the freedom not to speak and the freedom not to be compelled to support the speech of others. And we see this in the 303 creative case. We see this in all sorts of cases, the union cases where we think people have the right not to have to support union political speech. It's a very standard conservative position on the First Amendment that the word freedom to do something includes freedom not to do that same thing, right? So I, I can't be forced to speak. I can't be compelled to support others' speech. Uh, and, and the question then becomes, why is the government different? If I can't be forced to give money to a union, why can I be forced to give money to the Department of Labor who wants to run an ad campaign that says exactly the same thing on some political issue? For me, the answer is they can't. They're, they're not different in that meaningful way. So I don't see a conflict. I see it fitting squarely within sort of our broader understanding of the First Amendment. And from a textualist perspective, it, it, it derives from the word freedom of speech, which we understand to be a concept, not merely a freedom to speak, but it's the freedom of speech, which includes freedom not to speak. Gotcha. No, that 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 does make some sense there. I'm I'm curious though if this, um, as you're describing it, if you think it would at all abridge um, those govern government officials' right to speak. Well, like I said, if they're speaking in their individual capacity. I don't see a problem with it. So when a senator goes on the campaign trail and says, hi, uh, I think this policy and that policy by the administration are terrible, or I think this behavior by these private actors is terrible, and I would regulate them if you elected me or reelect me for Congress, I will do my best to regulate them. I don't think that is government speech. I only think it's government speech where they dedicate tax dollars to doing it. And look, we have this exact line drawing problem in terms of campaign finance, right? If you want to go on the campaign trail, you need to spend your own dollars and you can't spend public funds on campaign events. We draw a very bright line between what money is government money, what money is private money. 
And we protect very much the right of candidates, including existing government officials, to have private speech using their own private money. And this is no different than that. The, the one thing I'd say, though, because uh, I often hear the concern that this is a pretty radical limitation on what government can do. And, and I would say two things. One is that all I suggest is that government speech be subject to standard First Amendment analysis that we would apply to any other form of compelled speech or compelled support for speech. Sometimes it might actually win. Sometimes it might survive. If the government wants to get out there and say, look, we think, you know, this, this crazy website out there is really a Trojan horse to put terrible malware on your computer, and we urge you very much not to use it because it's going to destroy your computer and wreck our computer system, that probably survives First Amendment scrutiny, right? There's a compelling interest by narrowly tailored means. And I think, yes, the First Amendment applies to that government speech, but it doesn't forbid it. There's lots of instances of speech compulsions and even speech restrictions that under urgent circumstances easily apply. A second example of that would be, I think the government obviously is speaking when they publish laws, when they publish proposed regulations. Uh, but I think all of that, once again, survives any reasonable First Amendment scrutiny, and in fact, may be compulsory based on due process considerations. The notion that you could pass a law but not publish it would be a due process violation. So once again, the fact that the First Amendment conceptually as a framework applies to government speech doesn't mean it forbids all government speech. It just means it restricts things that, to my mind, would fall into the category of government propaganda. I see. Okay. So I, I, I got to ask, since you brought it up, do you, do you think that this idea that you have is a radical idea? I think it is the logical conclusion of a whole lot of First Amendment doctrine and a very basic understanding of, of the notion of freedom of speech. However, <laughs> there are plenty of Supreme Court cases out there that implicitly or in some instances explicitly reject <laughs> this proposition. So uh, the Summum case, which the government cites, uh, I'm sorry, which the petition, um, yeah, the government cites in its, its briefs in Murphy, sort of talk about that the First Amendment not regulating government speech. Then there's the Livestock Marketing Association versus Johans, which talks about why these, you know, beef, it's what's for dinner kind of ads were government speech and therefore okay. Those cases implicitly disagree with what I'm saying. I just think those cases are tragically wrong. Uh, and I think, in fact, the Livestock Marketing Association case, which said beef, it's what's for dinner, brought to you by the National Cattlemen's Association, when it called that permissible government speech, A, I think that was laughable. And B, I think it contradicts their more recent decision, distinguishing you know this recent decision that just came down about when is a government official website when is it personal? When is it public such that you can't restrict comments on it, right? This decision that just came out last month. I think that implicitly undermines the original theory behind the beef it's what's for dinner case, uh, such that that is not actually government speech. What it is is government censorship or compelled support for private speech. Uh, it's subject to the First Amendment that way. And quite frankly, even if it was government speech, the notion that you could tax all beef producers and then run an ad that says only buy from Joe's beef. Well, that might be government speech, even if you signed it brought to you by the USDA. I still think that violates the First Amendment. Yes, I think it's radical because I'm obviously taking a, a very big swing at a bunch of cases that seem to disagree with me. I just think that those cases never made sense in the first place. And the sooner we sort of get that through our heads, the better we can think about these admittedly complicated problems of who's doing the speaking, who's paying for that speech, and can the government put its thumb on the scale of the marketplace of ideas? Gotcha. Uh, so I, I, we only have a, so much time left here, and you've mentioned it a couple times, so I want to make sure that we get to it because we talk about it in our film too. But the, the, the big case where this really seems to come to a head is Mur Murthy, the Murthy case that was at the Supreme Court here. Yes. And look, I think the, the, the reason the justices are having so much trouble with that case 
is because they're starting from the wrong question. And so it's very hard to get to an answer. So the question that is mostly being debated is whether the fact that the administration, the FBI went in and jawboned and cajoled and bullied and maybe even implicitly threatened, does that somehow convert the platforms into state actors? And I think that's looking in the wrong direction. The question does, I don't think state actors, the state actor doctrine is the right way to do it. Certainly if the government went to you and hired you and said, I'm going to hire you to restrict speech, uh, then they become a state actor. But here, the government is going after a private party to try to coerce them uh, or, or even to cajole them and alter the marketplace of ideas just through speech. And, and if you look at it from my perspective, the, the question is not whether the consequences of that were sufficiently coercive to convert the platforms into state actors, but whether or not the government had any business talking about that stuff in the first place and whether the government was, in fact, engaged in ordinary you know, information dispersion to the public, which might be a, a proper, proper role for government or a duty of government, versus persuasion. I think government persuasion, which in other circumstances would be called propaganda, is sort of where a lot of the line goes. Uh, the government has the, the, the right and maybe the duty to inform us of things, but does it have the power and, and uh, in some sense the right to try to change our minds? And I said this in an earlier panel I did for the Executive Branch Review at the FedSoc. That, that, that gets it exactly backwards. The government's mind should be influenced and made up based on public input, not vice versa. It's not the government that is molding and shaping public opinion and public politics, but it's public politics that should mold and shape the government. And when you look at a top-down regime that says, it's our job to tell people what to think, that at its core is exactly the problem the First Amendment is designed to stop. Um, so, so to me, uh, the Murphy case I think there is a serious problem with government jawboning in some of these instances, but the lines I would draw would be slightly different. So the government calls up and says, hi, Facebook, just wanted you to know that we saw this signature of a Russian hacker group on these following 20 posts. Just want, thought you need to know this. Uh, I think that is probably okay. That's informative. That's giving information. Uh, if they say, and you better take them down because this is terrible and we don't like what they're saying, uh, that steps over the line. And so once we have a clear vision of what kind of speech is proper, what kind of speech isn't, we don't have to ask the question, did Facebook and Twitter and whoever suddenly become government agents? Because I think that's the wrong question. The right question is, did the government act appropriately in the first place? And if you're looking for government action, government coercion, the answer is they're taking public resources. FBI agent time that is paid for by public funds, uh, et cetera, the imprimatur of power that comes from sending an email from your FBI account or calling up and saying, hi, this is the FBI. All the coercion there is taking public resources and using them in a viewpoint-based way uh, to, to speak and to persuade in a viewpoint-based way that I don't think the government had the power to do in the first place, and certainly not the power to coerce me, the taxpayer, into supporting um, so the coercion happens earlier. It's less about whether Facebook is being coerced than whether they are co taking coerced resources and devoting them to a viewpoint-based persuasive enterprise. Gotcha. So it, it doesn't matter if it's social media companies. It could be any sort of situation where the government is um, pressuring or trying to persuade or coerce uh, particular viewpoints. Yes. So my, my, my cleanest example of this would be the government takes $100 million dollars to put up billboards all around the country that say, vote Republican, vote Democrat, uh, you know, support Obamacare, oppose Obamacare. It doesn't matter which way the advocacy goes. It's the fact. So, so they're, they're talking to the public at large at that point. And I still think that is inappropriately forcing people to support viewpoint-based speech of third party, third party being the government. So yes, that would be propaganda. It's like, you know, it's like when the Soviets get up and say, oh, vote for Putin. Well, I don't see why that's OK just because it's government speech. If somehow uh, the executive branch or an agency could take some discretionary funds they had and buy billboards trying to persuade the public to 
support their political views. So what's an example that I gave at the beginning about um, congressmen um, talking to tech, tech executives and having them testify? Uh, would that qualify as government speech and be prohibited under this standard you're suggesting? Probably not for two reasons. One, bringing them in in the first place might well be part of their lawmaking function. To, they're the ones doing the speaking rather than the Congress people. And you're right, there's a certain show quality to it. It's like a show trial almost. They're asking questions, but obviously the questions are loaded. Um, and so there is an implicit bit of speech going on there. But Congress certainly has the power to gather facts that it needs to perform its legislative function. Uh, it's an interesting question whether they have coercive power to do that. <laughs> that's almost like compelled speech, but thats a, I don't think that's the problem you were really talking about. Uh, I assume you're just talking about the, the implicit pressure to show up when Congress calls. Uh, and then the second thing is even when you know congressmen or senators, it, before they start asking their questions, give their, their uh, spiel about why they're right and the world's terrible and these tech executives all suck, that's certainly speech by someone in a position of authority. They've called you there. They have you as a captive audience. They're there sitting in their congressional chambers. Uh, so it's I, was, I, I think it's pretty clearly government speech. But the one competing factor there is that when they do that, it is literally covered by the speech and debate clause. So, so while I think the First Amendment in general applies to all these things, the speech and debate clause is a textual counterpoint to that, that very much, I think, gives them the individual right to speak and debate on the floor of Congress uh, and stops us from restricting them. And so it would be, it's sort of one of those things that even if the First Amendment did apply, this would be the instance of where it survives scrutiny because I have an express constitutional authority to do this very thing. And so, so yes, it might be government speech, but it's probably the kind of government speech that survives any level of scrutiny you would care to attach to it given that very specific constitutional clause. All right. Well, there you have it. Thanks for joining us, Eric. You're very welcome. And thank you folks for listening in. You can find the link to our film Jawboned in the description on our YouTube channel or at fedsoc.org. That's F-E-D-S-O-C dot O-R-G. As always, the Federalist Society takes no position on particular legal or public policy issues. All expressions of opinion are those of the speaker. That's a wrap. This has been a FedSoc audio production.